Sape satta bhavantu sukhitatta bhavantu sukhitatta Hello, this is Dave Jacobson, and I'm here with the 14th episode of Nibbana, the secret treasure of the Buddhas. What makes it such a secret? Well, because it's been mistranslated, it's been misunderstood, and it's been passed down incorrectly due to some commentator's personal ambition. We've explained all that in previous episodes, and now we kind of want to wrap this up and get on to the next section. Nibbana is usually translated extinction. But that's a kind of a loaded term. It comes along with an expectation or a connotation of annihilation. And annihilationism is not the Buddhist teaching. Although there are some people who call themselves Buddhists and who talk about nirvana, or actually in Pali, nibbana, but they don't really understand it because they think it means the end of the being, the end of everything. And that's just not true. A better word or a better translation for nibbana would be appeasement. And of course, appeasement means to bring about a condition of peace, calm, the uh, cessation of all conflicts, all disturbances, and like that. And usually appeasement has to be won at some cost. In other words, if I have an enemy who is bothering me, then maybe I can work out a compromise deal where I give something, he gives something, and then we're at peace. But with Nibbana, the peace is absolute. And it's free. There's no cost. We don't have to pay anything. But we do have to give up our attachment to I and mine. These are the principal obstacles. And in the next section, we'll see exactly how those obstacles function. And it's going to be quite revealing when we get into vortex theory and so on. Now, who is actually responsible for the misunderstandings around Nibbana? I think it's the commentators. It's the people who took the original Buddha suttas, the Theravada suttas, and then commented on them to explain them to other people. Well, this is wrong in several different ways. <laughs> First of all, the Buddha suttas don't require any explanation. They're perfectly clear, perfectly open, and complete as well. The Buddha said, I'm not like most teachers holding some secrets. I teach with an open hand. I'm giving everything. There is no esoteric teaching. So in that situation, there's really no need for a commentary. The problem is that people didn't like what the Buddha said. <laughs> they didn't want to follow what the Buddha said. They needed a basis on which to establish a religious teaching that could be used to uh, get ongoing donations from their congregation. And if Nibbana was too easy to obtain, if it was uh, too quick, then people wouldn't need them and they would go away and the monasteries would collapse. But, you know, according to the Buddha, we don't need monasteries. What we need is the Dhamma. Monasteries are not going to cure suffering. Dhamma is. So if we understand the Dhamma directly from the Buddha, that's the best way. The commentators just seem to confuse things and obfuscate the real meaning. And my personal feeling, it was to uh, establish and maintain their own reputations and to uh, create an atmosphere where it's harder to reach Nibbana. Or maybe they had no idea of Nibbana themselves because they weren't practitioners. They were working with words and symbols. And the very first thing about Nibbana is it's not expressible in words and symbols. So they made Nibbana into a thing that one could obtain or get or attain. Or they made it into a location like a place where you go, and then you go to Nibbana. But no, Nibbana is right here and now. It's Akalika. It has no time connected with it. So Nibbana can be any time, any place, 
Okay, there's no restriction as to time or place or the person. Anyone can attain Nibbana. If you are a conscious living entity, <laughs> if you're watching this video, you have everything you need to attain Nibbana. You just have to know how to utilize it. That's the Buddha's teaching. The Buddha is giving a process of becoming, Paticca Samuppada. Now, this process is going on anyway. It's a natural law, just like gravity. So we are all the time becoming something else. The, you hear the New Age people talk about transformation. Well, transformation is happening anyway. We're born as, a, as an infant, then we grow into a child, a teenager, a young adult, a mature adult, a middle-aged person, old person, and then we die. So transformation is going on. But by understanding the process of how it works, we can take this becoming and direct it in the way that we want. And what do we want? We want the end of becoming. We want the end of the samsara, the wandering around the cycle of birth and death. We want the end of suffering. And this is what the Buddha's teaching gives. So it's not right to call it annihilation. It's much better to call it appeasement or peace. Shanti, shanti, shanti. But people don't understand this either. And so we need a stepwise teaching. And the Buddha is giving that in the suttas. I don't know why people want to ignore the suttas and listen to commentators who aren't even practicing, but they're just men of letters, uh, collecting reports and stories from here and there, and collating and editing them into nice books. Well, that's very lovely, and I'm sure it's a great career. <laughs> I used to be a professional writer myself, so I know all about that stuff. But that's not going to help you actually realize Nibbana. What's going to help you is to practice. So how do we practice? Well, that's what we're trying to understand. First of all, we have to have right view. If we're holding wrong views about Nibbana, about the Eightfold Path, about the process of becoming, or about anything, then it's going to impede our progress on the path, which should only really take a few weeks or a few months. Uh, even Today, people aren't very intelligent, so it might take us a couple of years, well, two to five years, you know, that's plenty of time. But if a person is properly prepared, well motivated, and actually knows the process, they can become enlightened in a matter of weeks. So the problem with the commentators is that they didn't know Nibbana. They didn't know, but they were trying to talk about the path and because of that, the Buddha uses the expression, it's like building a staircase to a palace that you can't see. Now let me read you an excerpt where the Buddha talks about this. Potapada, it's as if a man at a crossroads were to build a staircase for ascending to a palace. And other people were to say to him, well, my good man, this palace for which you are building a staircase, do you know whether it's east, west, north, or south of here? Whether it's high, low, or in between? And when asked this, he would say, no. Then they would say to him, so you don't know or see the palace for which you are building a staircase? When asked this, he would say, yes. <laughs> so what do you think, Potapada? When this is the case, don't the words of that man turn out to be unconvincing? Yes, they are. Because he's trying to build a staircase before the palace. <laughs> How does he know where the palace is going to be built? He can't even see it. He doesn't know where it is. So in this way, the commentators are misleading. And as a result... Nobody is getting to the palace. <laughs> Nobody is going to Nibbana. Nobody is attaining enlightenment. This is the problem. So what we're trying to do is to present the correct view, the right view, the view of the Buddha himself. We're trying to be as transparent as possible and talk from the suttas directly. That's why I always give a reference for all these quotes. Another thing is, we're trying to be authentic. 
we're trying to speak from our own experience. Personally, my uh, principle is I don't discuss anything in these talks and videos that I haven't experienced for myself. So if I'm saying something, it's based on some experience that I've had, and I gladly share these experiences in here and in other places as well. So the core or basis of the Buddha's teaching is the Four Noble Truths. And the third noble truth is the truth of cessation of suffering. Uh, first noble truth is there is suffering. Second one is that there is a source of suffering. There is a cause. The third one is the cessation of suffering upon removal of the cause. And the fourth, of course, is the path, the Eightfold Noble Path, or the way to the end of suffering. So the Buddha, when he defines these four noble truths in the Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta, he defines the third noble truth in these words. The third noble truth is the complete fading away, cessation, giving up, relinquishment of that very craving, the release from and non-attachment to that very craving. So the commentators tried to say that this release from craving meant the destruction of the being. In other words, they contradicted themselves. They said that if you don't have craving, you cannot be, you cannot become, you cannot have a being in this world. But on the other hand, the Buddha is saying that this destruction of craving is the gateway to Nibbana. It is the cause of the cessation of suffering. So if the cause of cessation, of, if the cause of suffering is craving, desire, lust, avarice, greed, whatever you want to call it, uh, the need for things to uh, assuage the cravings of the senses, then the cause of the cessation of suffering would be the cessation of the craving. You follow? The principle of paticca samupada, of specific causality, says that when this is, that is. And when this ceases, that goes away automatically. So when there is craving, there is suffering. Isn't it? As soon as you have a desire, there's a kind of tension that, oh, I don't have what I want. I don't have what I need. Now I'm going to suffer. <laughs> you know, so then you make great efforts and maybe you finally attain the thing that you're craving. And then what? Oh, it's not perfect. It's unsatisfactory in some way. Or it's temporary. It's going to fade away. It's going to be finished. Either way, we never get really what we want. So desire is a losing game from the very beginning because it brings suffering into our lives. Huh? A simple child without any desires is laughing and playing. Huh? As long as he gets his basic needs met, he's fine. A few little toys, no problem. Everything's great, right? But then when we're adults, we have all these needs and wants and demands and desires and ambitions and so many things, and these get in our way. They produce nothing but suffering. So when we can let go of these things, when we can let go of the I that wants all these things, when we can let go of thinking that these things are mine or wanting them to be mine, huh? then again, we become like little children. And there's no problem, there's no struggle, there's no suffering. The relief is tremendous. You really should try it. <laughs> so the commentary is saying that destruction of craving alone is not Nibbana. That this directly contradicts the Buddha. So what can we think? After all of this, if the commentators are supposed to base their comments on the Buddha's teaching, and then they contradict the Buddha, not only in this way, but in many ways, um, it would be boring to go through all the different ways that they uh, contradict the Buddha. So we're not going to go there. <laughs> but what we are going to do is point out that 
these people have a very different point of view and a very different methodology from the Buddha himself. Therefore, we don't really accept the commentaries. We read them, but we read them very critically. Vishuddhimagga, for example, is a famous book. Vishuddhimagga is uh, practically the mainstay of Orthodox Theravada Buddhism. But it contains so many things that aren't in the Buddha's teaching or that flatly contradict the Buddha's teaching. So what are we to think? How are we to accept this? We have to accept it with the view that, oh, this is just some scholar's good ideas trying to make a name for himself. What else could it be? So the commentaries, books like Visuddhimagga and also Abhidhamma. Abhidhamma is in a very different style from the Buddha. And it redefines many of the Buddha's terms that he gives definitions for in the suttas. But they change the definition to fit with their analytical scheme. Now, I would be the last one to say that an ontological analysis of the Buddha's teaching is without any value. <laughs> I would be the last one to say that because ontological analysis is the most powerful tool that I know for establishing the uh, internal consistency of a teaching, the authenticity of a teaching. And I used it myself many times to clear up difficult and obscure points in various teachings. But the ontological analysis of Abhidhamma is based on redefining the fundamental terminology given by the Buddha and defined by himself in the suttas. So what can we say? How can we accept this? And yet, throughout the orthodox Buddhist world, these are taken as more important than the suttas. Well, what does that mean? It means they're not really listening to the Buddha, but they're more concerned with academics and their own reputation and well-being. So, for example, uh, this conflict about the idea of craving. Well, the Buddha says right out in the suttas that whatever bliss from sense desires there is in the world, whatever divine bliss there is, all these are not worth one sixteenth of the bliss of the destruction of craving. Why is that? Because... When we give up craving, we put down the burden. Huh? We lower the banner. We surrender. We say, okay, this is what life is giving me. This is what my karma is bringing to me. This is what I deserve according to my past actions. And not to fight it, not to struggle against it, not to try to get more not to try to assert our ego in the world, but to just surrender and accept it. It's such a relief. You know, the old joke about the man hitting himself with a hammer on the head, and someone asks him, why are you doing that? And he says, oh, it feels so good when I stop. <laughs> but we're all like that. That's why that joke is so funny. Because we're all hitting ourselves over the head with desires for prestige and popularity and fame and affluence and power and so many other things. As soon as we stop, ah, oh, the relief. So, we should understand that the Buddha's intention is to give us this relief, this release from the tension of craving and desire. So, as it turns out, the... Uh, real mechanism of the Buddha's teaching is something almost unknown today. It's not really a philosophical system or a system of mental speculation. It's not really a religious system or a system of rules and regulations and rituals. It's not any of the things that most so-called Buddhists have made it into. But the teaching of the Buddha is a deep ontological truth of how to become, how to structure our existence in such a way that we reach the end of becoming, the end of existence, of being in the world in the normal way. So let me read you one more thing. What is the use of a well 
if water is there all the time. Having cut craving at the root, in search of what should one wander? So the destruction of craving is not the destruction of a thing. Rather, it is giving up the desire to have something different than what is. If we just sit in meditation, the first thing that we notice how busy our mind is. Thoughts and pictures and memories and desires and so many things. Well, what if we just step back from that and we observe it and just let it be the way it is? But don't try to change it. Don't try to do anything to it. What happens next? We get bored. Well, if the game isn't about changing the way things are, then what is it? Well, it isn't. <laughs> That's the whole point. There is no game. The whole game is about changing things to be some way other than what they are. And we're saying no, no. Actually, that is the cause of suffering. Trying to change things to be some other way is the root of the cause of suffering. And the Buddha says once that root is cut, you know, when we cut a plant off on top of the ground, it can grow back. But when we cut the root, or maybe even pull it out, then that plant is never going to grow back. So the process of the Buddha's teaching, the actual uh, Eightfold Noble Path, is to root out this craving, this desire, this lust, uh, and get rid of it completely. And how do we do that? by changing our process of becoming. So the process of becoming is the central engine of progress in the Buddha's teaching, mastering that science and then using it to get to the end of becoming. And that is truly the end of suffering. Sabbe satta bhavantu bhavantu sukhitattah